from Canada to Britain. But there is one Canadian asset France does want, the right to fish in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, along with two tiny islands off the Newfoundland coast. The only part of Canada France wants is the fish. The British aren't sure what to do with a colony of French Catholics, but Benjamin Franklin reassures London the Canadians will not be a problem for long. Many will choose to remove if they can be allowed to sell their lands, improvements and effects. The rest in that thin, settled country will, within half a century, be blended and incorporated with our people in both language and manners. The new British governor is a general who spent two years of his life invading, bombarding and occupying Quebec. But James Murray's biggest challenge will be governing the peace, and he will find an improbable ally. Olivier Briand is a quiet, private man who has now inherited the leadership of Canada's Catholics. He must ensure the church's survival. He orders his parishes to accept the new king. The god of armies, who extends or restricts at his pleasure the boundaries of empires, having by his eternal decrees put us under the domination of his Britannic majesty, it is our duty, based on natural law, to be interested in all that concerns him. We order you to submit to the king and to all those who share his authority. Years ago, Briand tended the French wounded on the battlefields of Quebec, while Murray commanded the British forces there. Now the two men form an alliance that will grow into a lifetime friendship. Monsieur Briand has constantly acted with a candor, moderation and disinterestedness which bespeak him a worthy, honest man. And I know of none of his gown in the province so justly deserving of the royal favor. But a crisis is building for James Murray in an unlikely quarter. English merchants from Boston and London have been moving into Canada, eager to profit from the conquest. All have their fortunes to make, and I hear that few of them are solicitous about the means where the end can be obtained. In general, the most immoral collection of men I ever knew. The most hated of all is Thomas Walker of Boston. In two short years, he has alienated everyone, even the British Army. English soldiers go so far as to slice off his ear and toss it on the table, saying, this is for supper. I therefore stay at home and never stir out of town without two or three friends, each armed with a sword and pistols. I am never out of my own house after dark, and in going about any ordinary business, always carry a brace of loaded pistols in my pocket and a sword by my side. Walker and the English merchants want to control everything in the new regime, including the justice system. They insist that all juries be picked only from the Protestant English, even if there are only 200 of them. But Governor Murray surprises everyone. He sides with the Catholic Canadians. As there are but 200 Protestant subjects in the province, it is thought unjust to exclude the new Roman Catholic subjects to sit upon juries. As such an exclusion would constitute the said 200 Protestants, perpetual judges of the lives and property of not only the 80,000 new subjects, but likewise of all the military in the province. 
The English merchants are enraged mm -hmm. and complain to the king. Sign here. We believe that the admitting of persons of the Roman religion as jurors is an open violation of our most sacred laws and liberties and tending to the utter subversion of the Protestant religion and to His Majesty's power, authority, right and possession of the province to which we belong. The Canadians fight back. 94 prominent citizens sign a counter petition. One of them is the merchant Pierre Guy. Who are those who wish to have us proscribed? About 30 English merchants, of whom 15 at the most are settled here. Who are the proscribed? 10,000 heads of families who feel nothing but submission to the order of your majesty. Canadian merchants also worry about economic ruin. In the Quebec warehouse of Francois Babi, business is not going well. Business is advancing very slowly in this country. Money is rarer than ever, and bad faith is everywhere. And the English merchants are advancing new demands. They want an elected assembly, one in which only they can sit, since Catholics are barred from holding office in the British Empire. Murray urges London to resist all the merchants' demands. Little, very little, will content the new subjects. But nothing will satisfy the licentious fanatics trading here but the expulsion of the Canadians, who are perhaps the bravest and best race upon the globe. A race who uh, indulge with a few privileges that the laws of England deny to Roman Catholics at home would soon get the better of every national antipathy to the conquerors and become the most faithful and the most useful set of men in this American empire. Thomas Walker sails to London to fight for Protestant juries, a Protestant assembly, and the removal of Governor Murray. He loses on all counts but one. James Murray is recalled. Murray writes to his old Roman Catholic ally, Jean-Olivier Brion, who has just been anointed Bishop of Quebec. I have ardently wished to take your hand and sincerely congratulate you and your promotion, an event which has made me very happy, as I have done all in my power to contribute to it. My Canadien, I recommend to your care. They have behaved so as to fix my affection for them forever. James Murray will never see Canada again. His departure is a triumph for the English merchants, but they have yet to meet the new governor. General Sir Guy Carleton is 42. He is distant, reserved, and has been in the British Army since the age of 14. And he's been here before. He was wounded at the Plains of Abraham seven years ago. The English merchants believe this governor will favor their cause, but Carleton has a surprise for them. Barring catastrophe shocking to think of, this country must, to the end of time, be peopled by the Canadian race who have already taken such firm root and got to so great height that any new stock transplanted will be totally hid and imperceptible among them. He believes that Catholics should be able to hold office, that French civil law should be restored to the Canadians. Carleton also has very practical strategic reasons for placating the Canadians. To the south, there is growing restlessness among the American colonies. Carleton fears the Americans will rise in revolution 
and that France will support them. Should France begin a war in hopes that the British colonies will push matters to extremities, and she adopt the project of supporting them in their independent notions, Canada probably will then become the principal scene where the fate of America may be determined. Carleton sails to London, determined to be the architect of an enduring peace in Canada. But he finds London is more concerned with its American colonies. In Boston, crates of tea are dumped in the harbor to protest new taxes. To retaliate, Britain shuts down the port. It abolishes elections in the colonies and passes coercive laws denounced as the intolerable acts. Carleton has now been in London for four years, warning that the tensions in Canada must be resolved. And he is not alone. A Canadian arrives from Quebec with a dramatic intervention. Francois Babi fought with distinction against the British invaders of Canada. Now he is in London, bearing a petition from the most prominent Canadian families, supporting Carleton. Dissipate these fears and this uneasiness by restoring to us our ancient laws and customs, and to extend our province to its former boundaries. Grant us, in common with your other subjects, the rights and privileges of citizens of England. Then our fears will be removed and we shall pass our lives in tranquility and happiness and we shall be ready to sacrifice them for the glory of our prince and the good of our country. The Quebec Act passes the House of Commons in the spring of 1774. It restores to Canada all the interior lands which the Americans are claiming. It guarantees the Canadians their religion and restores French civil law. The Catholic Canadians are allowed to hold public office. The accommodation established here between French and English will become a cornerstone of the next 200 years of Canadian history. But in the American colonies, history will record this differently. The Quebec Act is the final intolerable act. The dream of an English-American empire embracing the entire continent is blocked. The New York Journal expresses the outrage. The finger of God points out a mighty empire to our sons. The savages of the wilderness were never expelled to make room in this, the best part of the continent, for idolaters and slaves. It appears to be the greatest stake that was ever played for. No less whether Americans and their endless generations might enjoy the common rights of all mankind or be worse than Eastern slaves. trial must now come to issue as open war is declared by the Boston Port Act and above all, the Quebec Bill. Open war with Britain comes six months later, on April the 19th, 1775, at Lexington. The American colonies slide into a chaotic revolution now Canada will have to fight for its very existence. <laughs> 